Warning! The following video very, very obviously contains enormous spoilers for Persona 5. Please do not watch this if you have not completed the game. So in this separate video, I'll give my thoughts on actual plot developments that are obviously spoilers. But first, one quick thing that I want to say that I didn't get a chance to in the previous video because I forgot. This isn't technically speaking a plot spoiler, but I guess it could be considered one, so it's going to go here anyway. One issue I have with the pacing of a couple of the plot-based confidants, specifically Magician and Fool. For both of these, they reach rank 9 about two-thirds of the way through the game, but don't max out until the very last two days. They're sitting at rank 9 for several in-game months, and that feels a little weird to me. I feel like they could have spaced out the ranks a little better than that. This also means that even if you max all of the confidants that aren't plot-based ones, you still can't get the Great Phantom Thieves Convene Trophy until just before the final dungeon begins. Now, something that I just want to make clear at first. I'm going to be listing off a lot of plot points that I had issues with. Everything that I don't mention here, assume that I loved it. Because I love most of the story of this game, but there are some isolated parts of it that I felt had issues, and I really do want to talk about those. Also, bear in mind, and a lot of people get on my case for this, I actually did spoil myself on most of the major plot points in this game before I played it, so none of the big reveals were a real surprise to me. What was a surprise was the actual dialogue around those plot points and how they unfolded, as well as the events that led up to them. Basically, I spoiled myself on every major plot point in isolation, but not the story as a whole. Which actually is how I got into Persona 3's plot as well. Though, by that time, I had more excuse for being spoiled because the game had been out for many, many years at the time I discovered it. So let's get right into it. The first issue that I have with the game's story, Matarame's arc. So, there's no doubt that Matarame is a pretty bad person. The problem is that anyone comes across as accidentally sympathetic when juxtaposed with Kamoshida. I felt that Matarame's arc coming right after Kamoshida's really diminished any monstrosity that Matarame himself would have had. Again, I'm not saying he's a perfect saint or anything, he's definitely a bad person, but his crimes can't help but feel much smaller next to Kamoshida's. I do like how the targets basically go up in terms of scale. What Kamoshida was doing was horrible, but it was just contained to one school, whereas Matarame is a much more influential figure in general society. The issue is that the vast majority of Matarame's crimes happened in the past. By the time you actually confront him, Yusuke is the only pupil that he has left. By contrast, Kamoshida is abusing the entire volleyball team, and heavily implied to be sexually harassing slash outright sexually assaulting a lot of girls. Matarame's only real crimes that are still going on are plagiarism and art fraud, and while that's certainly bad, it felt like there was a lot less of a sense of urgency to take him down than there was with Kamoshida. With Kamoshida, you were saving pretty much the entire school. With Matarame, you were really only saving Yusuke. The other issue is that by far Matarame's worst crime, at least to me, was letting Yusuke's mother die so he could steal her work, which is essentially what TV tropes would call murder by inaction. And bizarrely enough, this is the one crime that he does not confess to after having a change of heart. Which feels very weird to me. There's also the fact that if you do Yusuke's confidant, you find out that Matarame actually did care about him to some extent. And while I'm not saying that he's a perfect father figure or anything, it does mean that he has more sympathetic qualities than a lot of the other villains had. Not only does he come after such a horrible scumbag, but he also comes before one. The next villain is a crime lord who's running drug and teenage prostitution rings across an entire city, and was basically holding all of Shibuya to ransom. This again felt like someone who was such a priority to take down. 
The other issue with Madarame's arc coming right after Kamoshida's is the whole Anne nude modelling incident. Normally, I wouldn't consider this moment to be that bad. It's obvious she never has any intention of going through with it, and the whole part where she shows up to Yusuke's house wearing an enormous number of layers was pretty hilarious. If it weren't for the fact that it came right after she was suffering from sexual abuse. It also means that Yusuke doesn't make a very good first impression to a lot of players. So in general, I feel like the Madarame arc is alright on its own. The problem is where it's positioned in the story. For the next part of the plot that I want to discuss, I'm going to skip right ahead to the fifth palace. And the whole Ryuji versus Morgana, who was in the right and who was in the wrong incident. This really feels like this game's version of the October 4th incident from Persona 3, though thankfully it's far less violent. And it's over a much more minor issue in general. But it seems that fans are often at each other's throats over who was more in the wrong here, Ryuji or Morgana. And a lot of Ryuji fans and Morgana haters like to say that the game is a bit too sympathetic towards Morgana here and doesn't show him apologising for, for his part in what happened. Personally, I don't think this is the case. In fact, the game devotes an entire scene to Morgana explaining why he was wrong. Some people feel like it kind of rings hollow with how much he abuses Ryuji over the game, but I don't know, I still feel like neither of them really came off as hateable to me after the whole thing. Both of them got sufficient development throughout the rest of the game. One point of criticism, though, that I do agree with is the fact that the whole arc about a character feeling useless is very similar to what Makoto went through in the third arc. So in a way, there's a little bit of plot recycling there, and from something that wasn't actually that far back, too. Then we come to the fifth palace's boss. Now this actually isn't an issue that I have with the story, it's more something that I just wanted to discuss. But because it was a huge spoiler, I obviously couldn't in the last video. So, there's a lot of debate as to how sympathetic Okumura is supposed to be. Some people think that the game expects you to sympathise with him the most out of all the targets, and that it totally fails in doing so because he's actually pretty horrible when you think about it. Here's the thing though, I don't think he was ever intended to be sympathetic, and I think the reason a lot of fans think that he was, was because of only watching bits of earlier streams in isolation, not understanding Japanese, and jumping to conclusions. I admit, I was one of those people. I looked up just his boss fight, and the aftermath of it, that's all I saw. And from that, it's not hard to conclude that he's supposed to be sympathetic. He has a tragic speech after you defeat him, and later on he suffers a tragic death that traumatises his daughter. What I didn't see, though, was his entire dungeon beforehand. In other words, the actual context leading up to his boss fights. I didn't see him approving of Haru's very likely rapist fiancé. I didn't see the way his employees are depicted within his own palace. And I didn't see his fake change of heart before the actual boss fight. And especially, I wasn't paying attention to the exact dialogue during his confession, and didn't see that he pretty much admits to ordering hit jobs against his business competition. While he does say that mental shutdowns were not him personally, he does outright say that he ordered a lot of them for his own personal gain. That pretty much killed all chances of him being sympathetic to me. So like I said, I don't think the game expects you to find him a sympathetic or tragic character. Sure, his excuse for what kickstarted his greed is pretty tragic, but then again, every villain has an excuse like that. I feel like the response you're expected to have towards him is the same that a lot of NPCs have throughout the game after his death happens. Namely, sure he was a complete asshole, but publicly executing him on live television was going way too far. The other part of it being that even though he probably deserves to be targeted by the thieves, the lingering question of are they doing it for the right reasons? This point in the game was interesting, as the Phantom Thieves have become so popular, they're becoming kind of a slave to public opinion, which definitely resonates with the themes that come in at the end of the game. 
But the team spends the whole arc constantly conflicted between whether they're actually targeting him for the right reasons, or if they're only doing it to be more popular and because the public says so. And there's also the fact that the conspiracy set out to frame the thieves for his death. I think that's the real part of why the thieves are so horrified at what happens. They never set out to be vigilante murderers, and when this first happens, they get this strong sense that they might have accidentally done that. They didn't see his shadow self being shot, so for all they know, they caused that. And that's probably why Haru in particular feels so awful. I feel like, even if you did have an abusive father, you'd still be pretty horrified if someone murdered him and framed you for it. Sure, Haru does get mad and upset whenever anyone mentions her father later on, but it's usually in the context of villains gloating about how they killed him, so yeah, I feel like that's kind of understandable. That's all I have to say about that. Now we get into the real meat of my main criticisms of the story. I said in my first thoughts video that I felt that the seventh palace, which I can mention now, Shido's cruise ship, was the weakest arc of the game. Here I'm going to explain why, but first let's talk about everyone's favourite pancake trader, Goro Akechi. A bit of context here. I was along for the ride of the original Goro Apocalypse. For those who held out on spoilers before the game's English release, you probably won't know about what this entailed, so let me explain from the very beginning. Back when the game first released in Japanese, people data mined it pretty quickly. Among the first things data mined were the game's cutscenes. There, the first point of attention was the bad ending cutscene, which very blatantly showed Goro Akechi shooting the protagonist in the head. Then, people saw the true ending cutscene, which had all the Phantom Thieves riding off into the sunset in the Morganamobile, with Goro nowhere to be found. It was not hard to put two and two together after that. Goro Akechi was our traitor. At first, people reacted with extreme anger at this, because they felt that he was just the most obvious choice of traitor by far. He had barely any marketing presence, he's only around for one dungeon, and he's obviously antagonistic towards the Phantom Thieves. At this point, people even jumped to conclusions about his personality and motives, thinking that he was a villain who embodied the Shin Megami Tensei lore alignment, and hated the Phantom Thieves for not strictly following the letter of the law. Then people actually played the game, or at least watched streamers get up to that point, and then they realised just how wrong they were. Sure, Goro Akechi being the traitor was obvious, but that was the whole point. The player wasn't fooled for a moment, neither were the characters. The real plot twist can be summed up by a Team Fortress 2 voice clip of all things. We all knew you were a spy. It wasn't that Goro Akechi was the traitor, it was that the thieves knew all along. And I actually felt that this plot twist was very well handled. There's a lot of moments in there that do make you think something's going on, especially Futaba grabbing Akechi's phone and fiddling with it. At first you dismiss it as her general geekiness, but I got the feeling that something was going on there. The fact that at this point the drugs are starting to affect the protagonist to the point where bits of the story are missing, obviously there's something important there. There's also the fact that Akechi's voice acting, when he pretends to hear Morgana talk for the first time and be surprised, is very intentionally terrible. He's a bad actor and the thieves caught on to that. It also helps that the game makes it very, very clear that he's going to be a temporary party member, and that he was never a Phantom Thief to begin with, just a kind of enemy mind situation. In fact, he outright blackmails you into helping him. So already, you know that he won't be missed as a member of the party. Anyway, back to the Gore Apocalypse. Then players got to his boss fight, and everything exploded into a ton of memes. It was also around this point that translators discovered the real reason why the thieves figured him out. Pancakes. 
Namely, him mentioning pancakes, something that Morgana said earlier in the game, but only Persona users can hear Morgana. Which proves that he was lying later on when he only claimed to get his Persona later. At this, obviously, the internet exploded. At his boss fight, fans were really captivated by just how deranged and insane he went as the fight progressed. And then they found out his real motivations. The fact that he was the bastard son of the game's main villain, and that his whole plan was pretending to be on his side so he could get revenge on him. Definitely very different motivations than what people originally expected. And then came what happened after his defeat. The meme LOL 2 Goros pretty much sums it up. The fandom completely flipped out. He then has a very ambiguous possible death, and then... nothing much. And at this point, the fandom who followed the Goro Apocalypse were pretty disappointed. After all that, Goro kind of vanished from the plot after his supposed death. He's barely even mentioned apart from the start of the confrontation with Shido, and a lot of people felt that he deserved a bit more than that, because they actually quite liked him as a villain. So let's talk about Goro in general. Firstly, I guess I can finally mention him as a party member. You are under no illusion, like I said, that he's going to be with you forever, so you don't really need to care about his skills all that much. His overall stats are kind of similar to Haru in some ways, so it's not that big of a loss that you lose him. Admittedly, it is kind of an issue that after he goes, your only source of light and dark damage is the protagonist, so you'll need to make sure to fuse personas with Ego on and Korga on wherever possible. Hama and Mudo I didn't find to be that useful in this game at all, given there were ways to hit light and dark weaknesses without them, and in fact, hitting enemies weak to Hama and Mudo with those skills was actually a bad thing because it means you don't get to negotiate with them. All in all, though, his skill set was very similar to original P4 Naoto. I do like that he gets debilitated eventually. I mean, you're not going to see him get it normally, but in a new game plus, I'm going to try and grind him and use him for the optional boss fight. On to his character. He's someone who, like Wakumura, fans are really divided on how sympathetic he's meant to be. Here I kind of do agree. I admit that some points where the game expects you to feel bad for him do ring a little hollow when he is basically a mass murderer, who even admits he did it for his own selfish gain. One thing that I do like, though, is the variety in reactions that the party has. Arne is one of the nicer members, so she tends to mostly forgive him. Makoto is more concerned about the fact that someone who was so close to her sister was deceiving her the whole time. Haru can't forgive him for killing her father, but says that she does feel bad for him to an extent. Now, this isn't actually stated, but I feel that Haru might have some kind of kinship with him, because she too was desperate to be acknowledged by her father, who only really considered her to be a pawn in his schemes. So I get the feeling that she did see that they weren't so different in a way. Yusuke claims that he himself could have ended up like a Akechi if he hadn't found the party. Morgana is mostly concerned with his friendship with the protagonist and how genuine it was or not. And Ryuji. Ryuji refuses to sympathize with him at all. He makes it clear that he cannot forgive Akechi after everything he's done, no matter what kind of a past he has. In a lot of ways, I feel like the fact that some players find him sympathetic and some don't is justified. It's the same with the party as well. You are given the option to think for yourself how you feel about him, and whether or not you personally think he's redeemable after all he's done. None of the party members are called out as being either right or wrong for what they think of him, so I do feel like there is freedom to think what you want about him. All that aside, though, I will say that I was very, very worried about his English voice acting, because when I first heard that scene in Japanese, yeah, the voice acting went pretty crazy, and I was wondering how they could actually imitate that. Robbie Damon just did it so well. The voice was perfect for Akechi in his false nice guy persona, and when the facade breaks, oh boy, did he get really chilling. And then when he completely snapped, he did that really well, too. The main thing I'd heard of Robbie Damon before then was as Sori in Tales of Zestiria, who is pretty much a pure hero type character. So I was 
interested to hear he'd be cast as Goro Akechi, but I think he was perfect. I've gone on a bit of a tangent there. The main thing that I wanted to talk about was the issues that I did have with this arc. Now, I felt that the lead-up to the protagonist's fake death was all great. Most of that made sense. It's what happened immediately afterwards that was where the plot kind of fell apart to me. After you get back to LeBlanc, there's a scene where you go upstairs and Futaba and Morgana are there to give you tons and tons and tons of optional exposition about what just happened. It feels to me like the writers were frantically trying to plug a bunch of plot holes at that point. What if there was a cognitive Akechi? Oh, they found him and tied him up. How are they sure the phone would work? That's explained too. How did they make the phone work like that in the first place? Also explained. How did they listen in on Goro Akechi's phone conversations? Also explained. In some ways, it kind of feels like the writers weren't so confident in themselves if they feared that the fans would have that many questions and they needed to address them all at once like that. But that's not the main issue I have. The main issue here is there's one of these questions that's brought up that they don't even attempt to explain away. Namely, the fact that your confidant with Akechi ranks up when he's actually talking to the cognitive you, not the real you. Not even Morgana knows why that happened. Logically speaking, it doesn't make sense. Cognitive selves are not the same as shadow selves. What Akechi was talking to there was nothing but a figment of Saya's imagination that has no links towards the real protagonist at all. How did that rank up the protagonist's real confidant? You could try and justify it as the protagonist alone in his cell, thinking, oh, Akechi was the traitor all along. Rank you up! But that still doesn't, doesn't change the fact that you outright see him speaking to the cognitive protagonist, and you get the rank up there. You even see the protagonist's internal monologue there, even though that's not really him. And in fact, that cognitive protagonist shouldn't even be capable of having that kind of internal monologue, because Saya doesn't know that Goro Akechi is evil. It feels like a blatant case of making sure the player doesn't know the exact trick that's going on until it actually happens, but it undermines basic logic to do so. But here's the other part of this that I find annoying. He's revealed as the traitor, and then he proceeds to vanish from the plot entirely until just before his boss fight. That feels a little annoying to me. Someone who's been built up as a major antagonist, the one behind the mental shutdowns, and you finally find out who he is, it's given a big dramatic reveal, and then the plot's just like, oh wait, I can't do anything with this yet until the player has to fight him. And then of course, shortly after that, comes the scene that many players consider one of the worst in the game. The part where Akechi and the Big Bad long-windedly explain their entire evil plot so far just for the benefit of the player, because both of them already know this information. As many people have said, this scene not only goes on for a really long time, but it serves no in-universe purpose. What if there were people listening at the door? Wouldn't that be really bad for these two? But the main issue that I have with this arc is not a catchy at all, it's actually Shido. Is it just me, or did Shido end up coming across as a fairly weak villain despite all of his build-up? According to TV Tropes, I'm not the only one who thinks this. Sure, he's been a presence for the whole game, he's the big bad behind everything, you should want to take him down, he's close to becoming the ruler of the whole country. And yet, by the time you do finally find out that he's the villain, he serves barely any role in the plot other than being a boss fight. He's the only palace ruler whose shadow never confronts the party before his boss fight. I get they wanted to make it a big surprise as to what Shadow Shido looked like, but everyone else was a constant presence and a threat throughout their arc, while Shido, despite being the big bad at the head of everything, was pretty much just standing on the sidelines waiting for the thieves to just come and take him down. Sure, you confronted Shido in the real world a couple of times, but none of them really lasted very long, and also one of these moments I felt was kinda dumb. Ryuji runs out into the middle of a crowd, and basically yells at Shido in public. Shouldn't Shido have immediately caught on to this? He knows the general public adores him. 
seeing some random teenager suddenly come out and act openly defiant to his face should be a pretty big red flag that that guy is probably one of the Phantom Thieves. And yet it's implied that Shidor never even knows who the Phantom Thieves are, at least in the real world. His shadow definitely does. But like I said, his shadow never really makes any effort to do anything about it. He just is content to sit back in his own political room, boardroom, whatever it is, and just let his five mini-bosses do all the work for him. And when you finally do get to Shidor, it is a pretty epic, awesome boss fight, and I like the symbolism of all of his designs. But then you beat him, he has a change of heart, that's it. Really, he felt no different than any of the other targets to me. In some senses, he felt even weaker, because like I said, he doesn't do much in the plot after his reveal besides being a boss fight. His palace as well, I found actually fairly boring overall. When I first saw her on streams, I was thinking, holy crap, this is a very, very long dungeon. I certainly fitting for a finale, but I feel that it would get very, very draining eventually. When I actually played the dungeon myself, I found the opposite problem. It's actually not all that big, and it's surprisingly very, very linear. The only somewhat non-linear parts of it are the annoying mouse puzzles, and even then, those were nowhere near as difficult as I expected them to be. They're all fairly simple, actually. I did like all the mini-bosses and the actual boss fights in the dungeon, but it felt more like just a glorified boss rush than an actual proper dungeon. And for the second to last one, that felt a bit disappointing. On a related note, the SIU director. I wasn't really a big fan of this guy, the main reason being it was so blatantly obvious that this guy serves no purpose as a character other than to be a red herring. He only exists so the game can do meanwhile in villain land cutscenes without actually revealing who the real big bad is, and to make the player falsely think he's the big bad, and usually most players wouldn't be fooled. Because like I said, it's so obvious this guy only exists for that purpose. He's even killed off immediately once Shidor comes into the spotlight. I feel like his death is more of a case of you have outlived your usefulness for the plot rather than the conspiracy. The writers know that he's served his purpose and needs to go. So, for these reasons, I feel like the Seventh Palace was the weakest part of the game plot-wise. But the final dungeon's arc made up for it big time. Now, there's a lot that I could say here. I want to save quite a bit of it, because I don't want to step on the toes of a possible full Let's Play that I do in the future. There's a lot that I can talk about, and I'd rather save it for there. But, I just want to point out a few things that particularly grabbed me when I first went through. The first of which was the reveal of the real mastermind behind everything. Again, I had been spoiled on this before I played the game, but that didn't make the actual reveal moment any less awesome. It's kind of strange how the game has two hidden villains like this, Shido and False Igor, but I felt like False Igor was an example of this done right. Because he's always been there, watching you, right from the very beginning of the game. In fact, even beyond that, because the this is a work of fiction monologue is delivered by him. And that's one of those moments that, to go off on a brief tangent, gets actually really terrifying on a new game plus once you know that. Because what happens at the very end of the game? Yaldabaoth erases the Phantom Thieves from existence because the public doesn't believe they're real. What do you do right before starting the game? You accept that all the characters within the game are fictitious and not real. You contributed to erasing the Phantom Thieves from existence. Right from the start, you played into the villain's hands. Even the fourth wall is not a barrier to him. And even the fact that if you say no, you get booted back up to the title screen saying no, you're not allowed to play, is a sign of the fake Igor's true character. He is a complete control freak. You either play the game by his rules or not at all. One thing that I also found really cool about the new game plus is that there's actually a nice little bonus for you if you already know this. 
you actually have the option to act very antagonistically towards Igor from the start. And while you, at the start of the game, without this knowledge, will mainly take that as being like, why am I in this prison, and reacting to that, on a second playthrough it becomes, screw you, I know you're a fake. Which is kinda cool. There's a lot of foreshadowing as to his true identity that's a lot more obvious in hindsight. One thing that I liked in particular was his constant use of the term rehabilitation, without ever really clarifying what that means. At first, me and a lot of other people chalked this up to dodgy localization, but this was actually intentional. Rehabilitation being a meaningless word that's not really used the right way, but just used to sound fancy, that's exactly what it is. The whole concept of the protagonist's rehabilitation is just a lie so that the evil Igor can keep an eye on them. It is literally meaningless. You might notice that if you ever try and ask him to clarify what he means exactly by rehabilitation, he always dodges the question. There's also Welcome to My Velvet Room, as opposed to THE Velvet Room. Which is something that I actually picked up on when I first saw the Japanese trailers. The wording of that statement was different to the way Igor worded it in previous games, and I knew that had to be significant. It turns out that it was. This Velvet Room is his Velvet Room. It's a prison not because the protagonist is trapped in a metaphorical prison, it's because it is his prison. It's where he's imprisoning the real Igor and Lavenza, and also where he's keeping the protagonist as his prisoner and manipulating them to do whatever he wants. The fusion methods being noticeably more brutal than in previous games is also totally intentional. I will admit, though, this reveal is a lot more obvious in the English version than it is in the Japanese version, because Igor's longtime Japanese voice has passed away. Japanese players wouldn't really question Igor having a different voice, because that would be natural. In the English version, the fact that Igor not only is voiced by someone other than Dan Warren, but the fact that they are not even even trying to sound like his previous voice is much, much more suspicious. And it's a giant red flag that the change in voice is significant somehow. One other random thought when it comes to his voice, it was already pretty scary in itself, but I did not expect it to go fully filtered once he revealed his true nature. That made it even more terrifying. Another weird thing regarding the voice is that in the English version, when the original Igor does return, he still has a different voice actor. Though, thankfully, he does sound a lot like he did in previous games, so this is fine. One thing that does worry me, though. In the Japanese version, the real Igor was voiced by stock footage. Because of this, he didn't get a chance to have any unique lines that commented on the game itself. I'm really worried this is going to be the case going forward, out of respect for Igor's Japanese voice actor, because I would love to see Igor appear again in more games, and it's really sad that Igor's English voice actors will be kinda out of a role simply because of circumstances out of their control from the Japanese version. Back on the subject of the real Igor, though, his return was such a great moment. Hearing him speak in his familiar voice once again, it's just such a nice feeling to the player, realising that the old nose is in fact back, and yes, this is definitely the real one this time. What's even better is when you go back into the Velvet Room during the final, final dungeon. The prison door is open now. The protagonist is wearing their full Phantom Thief costume rather than the prison garb, and Lavenza's dialogue on all of the screens is no longer condescending like Justine and Caroline's. She's much nicer, she never refers to Persona Fusion as execution, and she doesn't even get mad when you skip through her dialogue. Also, you'll notice that all the chains on the menus are now broken. It's just all these little touches that I love. It'd be easy to just leave the Velvet Room similar to how it was for convenience sake, but they didn't. They went the extra mile with it, and it really helps make this feel just so much better. 
I also actually quite like the Prison of Regression as a dungeon. It's strange for me to say this, because I've heard that a lot of people don't, but I enjoyed it more than Shido's Palace to me. The whole atmosphere was just really, really great. The music in particular, the sort of dreary tone of it, and just the general look and feel of the place, it all just tied together thematically so well, and it felt really fun to explore just for this whole atmosphere. It also helps the enemies here really stepped up their game. In particular, I liked the Dionysus here. They have Thermopylae, which makes them one of the few enemies in the game that can actually punish you for getting an advantage against them in battle, which I thought was pretty cool and I wish more enemies did that. What I didn't like though were the enemies down there, I believe it was Neveros, the ones that use Brain Jack. Because at that point in the game, Futaba has Ultra Charge, and uh, Brain Jack plus Ultra Charge equals not good. The actual final part of the final dungeon was admittedly pretty much just a straight road with just a couple of branches off to get a few chests, and the enemies there were not all that interesting, or interesting for all the wrong reasons. Hi there, Mara, bringing with you your Torn King of Desire form as well, which for some reason is completely unrecruitable, but it's still an enemy. Kind of weird they did that. The mini-bosses were pretty cool, admittedly, though it was kind of strange. They all had unique voices in the cutscenes before you fought them, but in battle they went back to generic shadow voice clips. This was a particular concern to me for Michael, because I loved Michael's voice before the battle. It was actually so cool sounding to me, and hearing him snap back to just the generic angel voice set was kind of annoying. I admit, though, I laughed out loud when I first heard Gabriel, because it's very obviously the same voice actress as Yukiko slash Oya, so yeah, I was like, hi Yukiko, when did you become an angel? The actual final boss itself, I felt was a little weaker than P3 and 4's final bosses to me personally. P3's final boss admittedly had a lot of issues, the whole charm thing and it being incredibly draining with 14 forms. While Yaldabaoth technically had two phases to it, the Holy Grail phase was kind of a joke, and I never really considered that part of the boss fight. I have seen players on the lowest difficulty, but still, actually beating the Holy Grail without cutting its wires. While the second form was still fairly decent overall, I do feel like it had a bit too little HP, and very often, by the time it got to use all of its different sin attacks, or didn't, for me, I actually managed to finish it off before it ever used Pride. But yeah, generally by the time it cycled through all of those, the fight was nearly over. And it really had only one threatening attack, Rays of Control, which is kind of similar to Night Queen in Persona 3 in that it's a difficult attack for all the wrong reasons. Namely, the game doesn't really give you a good hint as to how you're supposed to stop it. Most players would simply guard here, that will get you horribly killed because the damage that it deals with all four arms active is gonna one-shot you even with guarding. I thankfully did know about this prior to the fight, but even then it was a struggle to take down all the arms before the attack went off. I feel like you should have had three turns and not two. It's actually asking quite a lot without charge or concentrate to eat through all of the arms in only two turns. And in my first playthrough I had an incredibly close call there. I had one arm left over unfortunately, and the protagonist just barely survived. Even then though, the final boss back in Persona 4 had two full phases, both of which needed to be completely depleted in HP before they kicked into the cutscene mode. This time it really only felt like there was one form here. As epic as the final uh, coup de grace is to this boss, the fact that it was entirely a cutscene and not actually a secondary phase to the fight felt a little underwhelming to me, especially with the amazing music that plays over the course of this phase, which really you don't get to hear for very long at all. I will say though that as epic as it was and as much as it fits in with the series themes of Bonds, there's only so many times I can take the whole final boss makes itself invincible, one-shots your whole party, but yay, the power of friendship saves them and someone's an ultimate persona thing, before I start getting a little bit annoyed. They've used this, it looks like you're about to lose, but the power of friendship saves you at the last minute thing, ever since Persona 3, and I kind of feel like they should maybe try something different with the way they end finales from now on. 
For one, Persona Q didn't need this, and it still felt awesome. And this game was being quite unique in the way that it presented its max confidant scenes. They showed up during occasional story scenes rather than just at the final battle. And were treated more as just members of the Phantom Thieves in general, rather than just people to summon the power of friendship through. Don't get me wrong, it still looked very cool, but I do wish they'd use a little more creativity with how they end their final bosses going forward in the series. Speaking of creativity, here's another issue where I felt the plot was definitely kind of copying some earlier games. The whole game between Yaldabaoth and the real Igor, where you've basically got one good godlike entity and one evil godlike entity competing to see whether humanity is worthy of saving, and the evil one rigs the game in their favour, felt very directly lifted from Persona 2. I know some people will like that as a callback, but to me it felt like they were reusing the same plot idea. Regardless though, I loved everything else about the actual finale, and it definitely felt like a great end to the game. There's a lot more that I could talk about, but like I said, I want to save that until I get to an eventual full LP of this game. Which may be a while. I'm gonna definitely want to do a full series on Persona Q first. I guess I should say that all in all I rank this game's story above 4s, but not quite as high as 3s. I'm actually more inclined to do a full LP of this game than I am of 4. Sorry, I'm just not quite as big a fan of 4 as, as most people are. I'm definitely more of a Persona 3 person. But with that, I hope you've enjoyed my thoughts on various story spoiler moments from this game, and I'll see you next time.